Hi, I'm Ross Brunson, and <clears throat> let's see, I've got a long and varied history in the in the industry. This is my, well, it depends on if you count CPM or not, this is my eighth major operating system. So I like to, well, I don't know if you count some of them as major. Anyway, um, we there's an interesting movement uh, in the world of being a sysadmin or system operator, or whatever you want to call it, and a while ago we decided that it wasn't enough to be a sysadmin anymore. So how many of you identify yourselves as a sysadmin? Okay, all right. Take issue with what I just said yet? Okay, some people do, they're like, sure, you would be a system, system admin and do everything. Well, but you could be DevOps and do most everything. It doesn't really matter. It doesn't matter what's on your name tag or you know what HR calls you as long as you get paid. And it's really what you do, right? Okay. So one of the things that I noticed was that like everybody keeps moving up the stack. And because they keep moving up the stack and things keep changing, it's when they start hiring you or not hiring you based on what you call yourself, then it really gets important, right? So as long as, as long, like if you're getting hired by somebody who does the same general job as you do, they can vet you and everything's pretty much straightforward. You either know your stuff or you don't, and you can usually do that in conversation, maybe a little test or something like that, right? It's when somebody has no clue what you do, and they're reading from a checklist, and it's got buzzwords on it that you don't have on your resume, you may not even get into the interview. So you can impress them with your sterling capabilities, right? It's all about getting into the interview. So one of the things that I have gone through recently was having to join an organization that's mostly developers and DevOps. And I'm going to define that, but this is really one of those things where you, you, know, you come across one of those blog posts somewhere that somebody has written because they've gone through hell. Okay, this is kind of like that for me. <laughs> it was sort of hell moving into this new area for me because I was a trainer, uh, system administrator, system operator, never a developer, still not a developer. And so I actually stopped short of the uh, DevOps writing code in the DevOps world. I don't really write code. I deal with other people's code a lot and I interpret other people's stuff and I read it and I make suggestions and things like that, but I don't really write it, okay? So perfect critic, right? You know, like the, the it comes from one of my uh, my coworkers. He's really impressed with my with my skills too. Uh, quick overview. Uh, we'll do that. I want to kind of set the stage for things. Talk about the transition over from being a quote unquote sysadmin into the world of DevOps. And just like cloud, a few years ago, everybody was talking cloud. Everything's cloud. Oh, for God's sake! Can you define it, please? What's a cloud? Servers that don't exist where you are. Okay, you know, it gets a lot more complex than that. DevOps is kind of the same thing. There's at least 15 different definitions of DevOps. Probably none of them are actually right. Okay, it's a combination of all of them. So, and uh, we have these. We have this wonderful tool called Slack. I'm sure many of you are, have Slack in your organization. We have these really great mission critical conversations, like uh, what is DevOps and is a hot dog a sandwich? And really, you know, really. <laughs> Oh, God. It was like 3,000 messages on that one. <laughs> and the only way to prove it was if the, if, if, if the edible product encloses the other edible product, then it's a sandwich. Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody even came up with like a nine-panel uh, way of, you know, like the cubosity of, of, it was like, you guys have way too much time on your hands. My biggest question to everybody in, the, in that Slack channel was, are you meeting your deadlines? That's all I want to know. Are you? <laughs> You're getting all your work done because <laughs> this is going on far too long. Uh, so we had a big argument about what DevOps was, and I just tuned it out after a while. Thank God you can do not disturb on individual channels. Okay. Um, we'll talk to you about what to learn. And so if you're coming at this from the perspective of, you know, I, I'd like to get into the world of DevOps. I'd like to get further <laughs> into it. I'd like to know if I actually am uh, a DevOps person, DevOps engineer. Okay. This is basically my set of steps of the stuff that I had to go out and, and identify with something to learn. Why would I want to do that? And then what are some resources? Now, I, I've got like 5,000 URLs in the set of the world's largest set of tabs. Uh, you know, do you know what Sidewise is? Anybody ever use Sidewise? Browser extension? Sidewise is amazing. It's like 19 bucks if you pay for it, free if you don't. And it allows you in Chrome to have as many open tabs as you can possibly have nested, et cetera, but it allows you to hibernate and wake up tabs and tab groups. This is the cat's 
back end, okay? I have so many open tabs that are not running in a process currently, and I can just, it's an entire set of research just bam, and, and it's open. Of course, if you open up too many tabs, like you accidentally open up the entire tree, there goes your machine. Okay, so I'm like, I'm just sitting there looking at it one day going, wow, I just opened up about 1,800 individual processes on this machine. This is not going to end well. And it didn't. Uh, so I really wanted to do with this was to talk to you about kind of the why to's, okay, and then give you links, um, the best link that I can come up with that kind of explains that particular thing. Give you a place to start, okay, and then we'll finish up with that. So we got 45 minutes and I've got a whole bunch of slides, but it, uh, slides are just a way of making sure I don't get too right-brained and, you know, I kind of stay on track for me. So there's no easy way. It was a lie. The whole thing's an absolute lie, right? People, people always come to stuff that says the easy way to understand real estate or, you know, uh, calculus in five minutes, that kind of thing. Right? It's not really easy. It's, there are easier ways to do it. So I'm hoping to give you some of the easier ways to do it. That's from my experience. And it's really a matter of identifying what are the pieces and parts. And there's, there's about 19 of them that make up this environment. And in the world of you know, the cloud and DevOps, et cetera, having 19 components to something sounds about right. Okay, anytime you've ever, you know, stood up something and, and uh, you know, it's got so many interdependencies that you're, you know, you can't even count them, right? So there's a lot of dependencies in here. There's a lot of stuff that won't work without something else. So you need to be at a, a median level or a, you know, somewhat competent level on each and every one of these. And there's a lot of them. So trying to make it as easy as possible. I also do a lot of work with our hiring team at my company, and then as I do a lot of the technical interviews and end up talking to people about, okay, well, you're great on this and this and this, but if you're going to do this job, you've got to come up on these three things. And so we literally in the process will tell them where to go in order to find that out. Here, go here and go look at this and see if you feel like you can learn that, okay? In the theory that hiring somebody shouldn't be such an adversarial process that you automatically reject them if they don't know something. If they can't learn it, or they're not interested in it, or they hate it actively and don't want to do it, well, that's, that's a good reason not to, to hire them for that, right? So when I talk about the easy way, it's like, how do you do it without driving yourself completely crazy? That's the easy part of this. And like everything else, it takes time and energy, and it's kind of a long road. I, I, I live in Montana, I decided to throw some... some uh, Montana pictures in here because except for one guy who lives in Kauai I've never had anybody say oh dude that's really ugly please don't show any more of that stuff <laughs> so he's showing me like Valley of the Three Kings stuff I'm like okay you win you win I cannot compete with that the, the key part of this is that if you don't like this if you go through this whole process and you look at it and you go I don't really want to learn that many things I don't really want to learn that kind of thing don't do it don't, don't go into the process with a, I'm going to make money out of this and eventually, because you, know, you can make a great salary. You can get paid really well as a DevOps engineer. You can start power drinking on your third day and never make it through the year if you're not supposed to be a DevOps engineer and you're trying to do it. Okay, it's a, it's a hard thing. It's like being a trainer. People, people go and look at trainers all the time and they're like, how hard can that be? It ain't easy. Okay, if they're making it look easy, it's because they've really worked at it really hard. Same thing with anybody who does anything. If they're making it look really easy, it's probably not. It's that they've made all the mistakes, and you're just seeing them after several thousand hours of, of screwing stuff up that nobody else saw, and now they can do it, right? It's a secret. Okay, so Amazon refers to people who are in this industry and who do the kind of things we're talking about as builders. So uh, we, we had a um, <clears throat> we were we go to reinvent every year, and we had a counter for the number of times in the keynote that the keynote speaker said the word builder or builders. I think it was 74 in a two-hour presentation. A two-hour keynote was killer anyway, right? But but it was really interesting because if you're a builder, that means that you. It's not hardware these days. It's all software. So everything is in software. Now, I'm aware that some of you are looking at me going, I've known this stuff forever. I build stuff all the time. I'm out in the cloud. I'm doing whatever. may not be the best session for you. This is the, this session for folks who have not quite got the enormity of what's out there yet, okay? Because I'm, I'm off in the training world. 
I wasn't thinking about building stuff in the cloud. And when I joined a company that builds stuff entirely in the cloud, entire infrastructure, absolutely <coughs> everything except for the laptops and the cabling in the, in the offices is completely off-prem. There are no computers other than individual computers in our entire, we have over a thousand people. So, you know, one, one decent, uh, you know, May, May East gets taken out and, you know, us and the rest of the Eastern Seaboard are completely dead in the water, right? So it's, it's an interesting thing to do to base your entire organization and all of your money and everything else on something that you can't see and can't touch. It requires a lot of what I call belief, okay? If you don't believe in it, that it works. And I'll tell you, a lot of senior executives, when you go in and you talk to them about software as a service and you, you know, using systems that are uh, off-prem and stuff like that, they look at you as if you've just espoused something horrible. You know, like, why would we do that? Because the economies of scale are so great. Because we can use, you know, we can use auto scaling, and, and you know, we can we can get featured on on uh, somebody's show, or you know, Twitter decides they like us today, and you know, and a, and a million people come and show up. What's well, going to cost us money? But there's a million people are going to see the product instead of a 404 page. That's good, right? And they go, yeah, okay. And then you look at them and go, yeah. <laughs> That's why we're going to use off-prem the cloud. Oh, okay. How much is it going to cost? Oh, okay. So if you don't like this, don't do it. But if this intrigues you and you think, wow, it'd be really cool to be able to build all this stuff and you know, just pay for the stuff that I use, right? Then this is a good thing. I used to say to people, if, if you're gonna be a system operator, you have to like server rooms and you have to like rack servers and you have to like server exhaust and you have to like to breathe that. And you, you, know, you wanna get away from the users, right? Well, people look at me nowadays and go, server room? What the hell's that? <laughs> How many of you have a server room that you, a literally honest to God server room? Okay, <laughs> okay. now that's, that's, that's not too bad, about half of you. You know, 10 years ago, I wouldn't ask the question, it's a stupid question, right? Everybody has one. I would be asking, how many of you have a floor mop sink in your server room? <laughs> right? So, and there's probably a few people who still have that. Okay, so let's talk about the transition over to things. I'm just kind of putting it all together. So where did we all come from? Where's, wh what's, what did we used to do and why was it different? So we had this divide of the sysadmin, the system operator, and it were the server people, right? Typically the ones who uh, you know, took this, got the servers, uh, installed the software on them, did all change management and backups and you know, just troubleshooting and the whole ball of wax, right? And then you had this other crew called the developers. And developers typically did stuff on their local systems and then they committed their code and then it got tossed over the wall and then it became the system operator's problem because it worked right over here and if it doesn't work over there, it's not my problem, it's your problem. Right? You ever heard that conversation? Okay, that conversation doesn't occur quite as much anymore. But we also had physical machines. And I can't tell you how happy I was when we finally started to get into virtualization and snapshots and things like that because one of the things I hated the most in life was reinstalling something because somebody had made some stupid mistake <laughs> caused me to have to reinstall it, you know? Just cloning something or, you know, firing up an AMI and, and, and going forward, or just, you know, kicking off a playbook and, and, and firing the whole thing back up was so much nicer and so much better, okay? So I remember things like Ghost and, you know, Clone Magic and stuff like that. These were, these were wonderful things in the day, right? But now we do it completely different. And, you know, of course there was change management. So there was nothing like installing a system and then over the next three months, there would be at least 300 changes that had taken place, none of which could be easily automated. And so there would be this massive change management log that went along with the server, and if it ever went down, then it was some poor intern's job to make the thing whole again, right? So some of you were like, that's barbaric. Yes, it is. <laughs> it was very barbaric, and having to be the, the junior guy to do that really sucked. So I like to say there's ops and then there's dev. So the way I do this is there's dev ops up to the point where you actually start to create code and, and deploy applications and stuff like that. And then there's the very developer code uh, uh, deployment friendly version of being a system operator. Call it sysop plus or whatever, okay? So DevOps minus is sysops plus, okay? It's like grades, A plus, B minus, that kind of thing. So I'm a nice, solid sysop plus DevOps minus, okay? And I'm, and I'm happy with that and that's okay. Um, but the reason why I say that is because what you're really doing when you're a, a sysops plus 
is you're taking all the stuff that used to run on, on the physical machines and you're turning it out into the cloud. Now, initially this was kind of horrifying to everybody and some of the primitive uh, deployment tools that existed when this first be became a, you know, a big thing, they were, they were pretty rough, okay? But the whole goal here, be more automated, do better monitoring, and it's a lot easier to scale. When, when you see something happen that causes your application to go from an expected number of users served to an absolutely insane log logarithmically higher number of users and it's still serving, there's like a little, like, you know, I've just seen a ghost. <laughs> oh, wow, that's awesome, that's great. Nobody's gonna get fired today, okay? Not for that, but, you know, probably other stuff. But it's really awesome when that kind of thing happens, and that means that somebody's done their job. They've looked at it, they've done, they've done the forecasting and all that. At a certain point, you have to test it, right? So, and that whole concept of watching somebody build an entire environment, go through the test, it's a perfect production-ready environment, and then they just, like, wipe it out. And you're, you know, okay, so if you come from the world of physical servers, you still get this little kind of sick feeling in your stomach that you just killed Timmy, okay? You killed it. Why'd you kill it? Well, because it means nothing. We just build it again. It's all in the AML file. It's all in the configuration files. Okay, once you get used to that, you're like, ah, just kill it. No big deal, right? It's all Dixie cups. It's potato chips. We'll make some more. Don't worry about it, okay? So that takes a little getting used to. Really takes some getting used to on the executive front because they don't understand that. They, they have no idea what you're talking about. And if you're not careful, they'll mistrust you even more than they typically do. So executives already distrusted system operators, right? Because we were into stuff like sarcasm, okay? You know, <laughs> you know to executives, sarcasm is witchcraft, right? It's like, you know, I mean, he was mean to me. <laughs> no, he just simply was trying not to, you know, <laughs> not to be too rude. Um, if, you're, if, you, if you talk to them too much about this stuff and you use the phrases that you will amongst each other, you will confuse them even more. Okay, and so I have executives in classes every once in a while. It's really funny because you know they get this. They're there to make sure that their people are doing what they're supposed to be doing, right? And so you have to have these long conversations about okay, let me, you know, ignore all the stuff we talked about in class. Here's how you figure out if they're doing the right thing. Okay? Here's the metrics that you can use to do that. All right. So in the old days, notice I threw a. Can anybody identify what that is? You can't probably see it very well. You know what that is? The difference engine, Babbage's difference engine, okay? How many are into computing history? I am computing history, okay? <laughs> so, all right, Charles Babbage's difference engine. I just throw, in the old days, it's something really old, okay? All right, so we had the sysadmins who did the servers. Everything was done manually initially, okay? Very, very manual process. Then we got into some of the automation stuff. So uh, over on uh, Solaris, we had kickstarts, and we, you know, we've got the you know, Anaconda kickstart on the Red Hat side, and we've got the Auto Yast and, you know, and all the different stuff on, on, the, on the SUSE side. There's all kinds of tools there. There's a lot more tools now, but they're not really used against physical servers. They're used against the cloud instances, okay? And so the developers who wrote the code, at a certain point, it's considered to be done. In other words, they made you stop working on it and release it, and so over the wall it goes, and it lands on the sysadmins. Well, I remember some very, very tense meetings, okay, a lot of very, very tense meetings, where everybody was trying to prove that it wasn't their stuff that caused it to blow up, okay? So now, in, when we mash the two together, it's this whole environment match problem, is if, if you do it right, you're working on exactly the same environment, just everything that's gonna be in production. And the DevOps person, the person who's writing the code, is literally almost always responsible now for being the one who makes sure that it works in production. Okay, I like that. I like the person writing the code being responsible for making sure that it works in production, as opposed to it landing on me, and trying to figure out what they did and why it doesn't work in production on a system that's supposedly exactly the same. Are they always the same? Oh no. Okay, you can still have that stuff happen. Uh, in this environment, but it's a lot less that it happens. Okay, so nowadays, what happens, you gotta have them be identical. So all we do is we put all the infrastructure out in the cloud, and because it's out in the cloud and everything's done in cookbooks and YAML files and just everything is set up before, they've merged, okay? So the hybrid of this, of these two merging together, 
is you get somebody who's responsible for coming up with the code or maintaining it or whatever, and they're the one who's responsible to make sure that it works both in test and in dev. This is very logical to me, but it wasn't possible before you were able to do these things all completely out in the cloud and be able to automate everything. It just didn't work that way. You, you, the, the, the people who ran the servers weren't the people who wrote the software. Okay? So this is and just kind of bringing you up to speed on this and, 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 and how we got where we're going. So my biggest challenge in all this was believing. I had a belief problem because I couldn't see anything. I couldn't put my hands on anything. And because it was developers who were telling me everything was going to be okay, I didn't believe it. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, but <laughs> we had all these interdependent interdependency problems. If you've ever watched somebody try to get an environment going, it's a lot of trial and error. There's so many different pieces and parts that have to come together and be the right version that doesn't conflict with this and that. And so once you get it right, it's like, oh, this is awesome. But then all of a sudden you wake up sweating in the middle of the night realizing that if somebody doesn't do something just right, they're going to pull an update in the middle of something else and it's going to break the whole damn thing completely. So now we've spent all this time and energy making sure that we can survive hundreds of millions of hits and it breaks. And the thundering silence of those missing hundreds of millions of hits and the money that's being lost Guess what? It was us. We did it. Okay? So that's why it's really hard to have executives and non-technical people believe this stuff. Because they don't believe it exists in the first place. They don't half believe you that it's actually out there except for it's earning money. And if you're not careful, you can make them not trust you even more. So I like to say don't, don't show them too much of what's going on. Show them stuff that works. Okay? All right. So this brings me down to... If you've decided, after all this, nobody has got up and got up and run out, so if you did, I wouldn't be concerned. <laughs> um, but if you've decided that, you know, I want to know more about this and I'd like to figure out the pieces and parts and where can I go in order to, you know, how many of you think that you know all of the sections that I'm about to show? That was a pretty safe bet. Because <laughs> you know what the hell's in my presentation. Okay. <laughs> Let's throw something up here and let's see if, see if this will change your mind. Okay, now how do you feel? Anybody, anybody got it all? One guy. Okay. Give me another Two. month. Okay. <laughs> sure, sure. Okay, so in, and, and you're a developer, right, DevOps? I am senior DevOps. Okay, so that'd be three months. Got it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's talk about what we're going to do. I'm going to go right into it because I said, what do, what do you want to learn? What do you have to learn? This is the set of things, not necessarily in order, but mostly in order, that I had to do in order to be sysop plus devop minus. Okay? All right. Um, when I'm, I, I use a product called ScreenFlow to do a lot of you. Anybody work with ScreenFlow know what that is? It's, it's um, well, one of my coworkers likes to call it, uh, uh, what's the tool? Premier for managers. In other words, it's like you, if, if you were smart enough, you could use Adobe Premiere or Final Cut Pro or something like that. But because you're not and you're kind of a manager, you have to use this thing, right? So it's got training wheels on it, okay? So I, I, I recognize that I've got some training wheels on the stuff that I do, so it's okay. But we'll get there. So everything is code. Absolutely everything is code. And I like to say that if, you know, if, it's, if it's in ANSI, it's probably going to be treated as code. Right, so everything is, and I'll show you later on. There's a guy who does a thing called GitHub for Poets, which is the most amazing thing ever. By the way, if you would like to have a copy of the slides, I'll, uh, my email address is on the end here. You send me an email, I'll send you a copy of the slides in PDF. Okay, that's uh, that, and, I, and I was realizing as I was putting all these URLs in here, I'm like, maybe I should let people have this <laughs> instead of trying to write it down. So those of you who are thinking about trying to write it, don't bother. I'll send it to you, and there are live links. Every one of them is okay. So if it's, if it's text and it's in a file, I treat it as code, okay? Even writing is code for me. So, and, and it all gets handled the same way. So if you're going to go out and learn how to code, so if you're going to be a developer, you know, a DevOps person, you probably need to understand code at the very least, and maybe you're not going to end up writing it. I don't write it. It's just not my thing, okay? So 
If you want to go and look at Python, look at Go, something like that. If uh, how many how many know how to code already? Okay. Okay. Now, how many of you are writing production code out of that group? Significantly smaller amount. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. Yes, I I like to play drums. I don't play in a band very often because <laughs> I'm not that good. <laughs> I like to say I'm a drummer, and sometimes people disagree. Okay. So, so I hit things with sticks. So if you're in the I hit things with sticks category of coding, it's fine. It's okay. Uh, but, but you will be a better DevOps person if you understand what the people that you're supporting are actually doing. Okay? So that's the concept of that. Linux. I mean, I, you know, I can't quite really believe that we're talking about learning or knowing Linux at this particular time frame. Now, I, I, I want to be kind with that because I work in an organization full of people who cannot believe that I don't understand everything that they do. You know what I mean? Like the, 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 the sort of inside baseball explanations that you kind of go, wait a minute, there are large pieces missing from this. There's shared knowledge here, and I don't have that shared knowledge, so it, this just doesn't work for me. So if you, um, okay, I'm going to ask, how many of you don't know Linux? If you don't want to raise your hands, don't bother. Okay, most of you do. Okay, great. So you're going to encounter new people especially or people coming over. So Salesforce was a good organization for this. Um, we did a series of classes, saying, you know, just for the Windows developers who are being transitioned over to the Linux side, how to do their development on Linux as opposed to Windows. And it was actually really good for me because it taught me that not everybody in the world right now understands Linux, knows Linux, and likes it and loves it and sometimes hates it as much as I do or we all do. Okay, so if you need to do something like that, will you see the LPI booth out there? I used to work for LPI. I was their member services director for about six years. Great organization. Okay, it, it's, it's them. It's Linux Foundation. <coughs> you can go to anybody who will teach you Linux and find out about this. The reason why I say to go to one of these organizations that certifies you is because there's a track, there's an ecosystem around it. And so if you give yourself a little bit of time every day, you can learn whatever you need to learn. Okay? A lot of people learn in silos about Linux. And then when they go to take the certification, they look at it and they go, wow, there's a whole bunch of crap in here that nobody ever uses. Excuse me, Grasshopper, that you don't ever use. Okay? Because it's really wide. And you may use these six silos and not the other 14, but somebody else has their own unique mixture of silos that they can't believe that you don't know the stuff that they do, right? So cue the religious wars about, you know, who needs to know what and why and all that, okay? So, but I suggest that you go over and take a look at the two orgs there and see if you can't do everything that's listed in the objectives for the junior level, the sysadmin one level for each of these, go study it. You don't even have to go take the certification. It'll just make you better as a sysadmin and DevOps person if you know those things. Okay? Networking. This is always an interesting one. Now, I come from a time frame where you had systems, uh, you know, operating systems people, networking people, security people. I mean, we, you know, I worked in organizations where there was a group that dealt with certain protocols only on the networking side. Not even hardware, just certain protocols that went across the network they were that big, okay? And then I've also worked for organizations where I did absolutely everything. You know, I was the guy falling through the ceiling tiles in the middle of the night trying to get <laughs> stuff fixed, okay? Yes, I have fallen out of a ceiling tile. It sucks, okay? Um, <laughs> and I'm still here and I can walk. <laughs> um, I was so glad when networking, you know, when, when uh, wireless became business ready. That was just awesome. I like to stop dealing with all this crap. Uh, okay, so everything is connected, and you have to understand the fact that because everything is out in the cloud, everything becomes software-defined, right? Software-defined networking is how almost everything works. So in my organization, for example, the only networking in the organization <coughs> is how to get out to the wide area network in order to get to the stuff that's out there. All of our... Every bit of our networking that we do for our systems exists solely out in the cloud, and of course it's all software defined. So if I don't have a concept of what defining software, in, you know, software defined networking as in, let's say, for example, let's do, say, VMware systems. You want to put several VMware uh, virtual machines, uh, you know, uh, to be able to talk to each other and only talk to each other, and then... Uh, you know, the, one of them is the load balancer in front of three other systems. And nobody should be able to get to the back end systems. They can only get to the load balancer. Okay. 
that's, that's all software defined, okay? So you can do software defined networking on a massive scale or on a very small scale. But it's good to know about it. There's a great Udemy course, Software Defined Networking Made Simple. I can't believe the amount of great stuff that's out there <coughs> for you to just go and consume, you know, essentially for free. And if you like it, then you can go buy the next one or whatever. So Udemy is one of those. Uh, I used to go to all the MOOCs, the uh, massive online, you know, uh, open online courses and stuff. But MOOCs tended to be kind of like the smell of popcorn versus the actuality of eating popcorn. You know, it just, a lot of them didn't quite go far enough, you know. So I think we might see those dropping a little bit. Security. Let me tell you about that memo. Okay, nobody wants to be the person who is mentioned in that memo. Even if they're not mentioned, everybody knows who it is. Case in point, uh, Cyber Crime Task Force, Las Vegas, Department of Energy, FBI, and the Las Vegas Police Department all got together, and they needed to learn Linux because they were using a tool called SMART, which is a forensics tool for catching uh, you know, people who do child porn and stuff like that on computers. So I go out and I get lucky enough to get bid for the class, and I go and do the class. One of the guys, about halfway through the class, are on a break, and he starts laughing because he's just checked his email. Well, it's, its name is Bill. Bill's a good friend of mine now. We've known each other for about 10 years. But at that point, I didn't know that it was, was not a good idea to ask Bill what he was laughing at. Quickly, I, by the end of the class, I knew never ask Bill what he's, asking, he's laughing at because it's probably not safe for work. This one was okay. He was laughing because the entire police department, and it's like, you know, however many thousands of people, had just got a memo that it was no longer considered acceptable to T-hook a full cement truck. Now, for those of you who don't know what a T-hook is, if you think back to your uh, cop shows or whatever, it's where the police car pulls up next to or slightly ahead of, and then pulls in front of the vehicle, and it runs it off the road. You got it right there. Okay, I saw a couple people go, okay, I got it. So, full cement truck. Guy's had a really bad day. He's had a little bit of methamphetamines, and he's not stopping for anybody. And he's going down the strip at a high rate of speed in a vehicle that is many multiple tons. The thing is still spinning on the back, <laughs> sloshing concrete out the back as they try to run him off the road, okay? Everybody's not having a good day. These guys pull up next to him and they perform a classic T-hook. And the vehicle continues going, crushes the back flat, pops the wheels, everything else, crushes the back of it, crushes the front, the engine compartment flat, and drags the pumpkins, the gearboxes, across the top where the two terrified officers are slumped down in the seat watching all this stuff go by overhead. Drags the Christmas tree and everything off the top. They survive. Yay. Yeah, I'm like, yeah. hey, that's, that's the way to go. You know, get out of it and go, oh, what happened, right? So then they write this memo, and everybody knows what it's about. So Bill, being Bill, decides he's going to write a memo back there and write a note, and he hits reply. Somebody was stupid enough to allow this. He hits reply to all and says, well, is it okay to T-hook an empty cement truck? <laughs> I, was, I was telling one of the guys at lunch, I said, you know the concept where somebody says to you, that was funny one time, <laughs> right, like, that was really funny, don't ever do that again. <laughs> so they never sent out another memo that, that enabled reply to all, and Bill was responsible for that. So I tell people, please don't be the person that that memo gets written about because of some horrible thing that you accidentally enabled out there. And there's a lot of different, you know, HIPAA and all the, all the different stuff, the PCH and all these different rules bodies, they just make it more complicated because there's so many different things that can interact, like in a retail environment. If there's a retail environment that somehow has to do with medical systems and medical data, you can't really get a worse conjunction of rules anywhere else. Okay, throw a little government in there, you're done, okay? You might have stuff that doesn't work because the rules don't allow it, all right? So I just tell people it's real simple. Go look at the different things. Go, go try to figure out what it is you're supposed to do and not do. And if you want to boil it down to as simple as possible, don't run the stuff you don't have to, and don't ever open a port if you don't have to, okay? This solves a lot of problems right there. Now, you're going to need to know stuff like... TCP wrappers. You're going to need to know, you know, host allow and deny. You're going to need to know some SE Linux or some App Armor or something like that. There's a lot of stuff that you need to know in that, but you got to start simple. So go out, take a look. GitHub's got a really nice description of how to do secure application deployment. 
out there. GitHub's really impressing me with the amount of learning and other resources that they're putting out. I mean, they're taking this seriously. Have you used the little GitHub tutorials, the live tutorials yet? <laughs> they're, they're awesome. Go look at them because it basically they start you off with no repo. You just signed up, and they'll walk you through everything and check to see if you did it inside your own repo every step of the way. It's really well well thought out and well designed. <laughs> it's GitHub. Uh, GitLab a little different, but the GitHub, well, that's where it came from, but, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> See, I always tell people, if you, if you, if you really want to know the stuff that's wrong with you, just get up and show your stuff to other people. <laughs> They'll let you know. <laughs> They're like the largest spell checker in the world. <laughs> All right. So, scripting. How many of you, okay, let's start another argument here. Is scripting programming? Oh, I got a no, I got a yes. <laughs> okay, we could argue about that. Um, I like to say that scripting is like a giant glue gun. Okay, it's the stuff that makes other things work. So I, I wish I had the cartoon, but there's a cartoon of a, a two people sitting down and they order burgers. And one of them, one of them uh, says, can I get some mustard? And the, the, yeah, they bring over the mustard. The mustard happens to be, it's labeled JavaScript. And so they put some mustard on their sandwich and they keep going for the next six panels as more and more and more mustard and JavaScript on, on the site, right? It's like, okay, you can kind of overdo this a little bit. But if you're, if you're trying to build a site, you're trying to come up with something, you're trying to make something work, scripting is a great way to automate little bits and pieces. The, the way I look at it is, Programming involves things that don't involve running other commands in a sequence, okay? And user input from the command line and stuff like that. Scripting kind of stops at one point and programming takes over from there. I'm really talking about scripting. Now, I can't tell you as a, a sysadmin and, you know, now a, a sysops plus who has inherited many, many, many systems over the years and left a number of them behind myself, how important it is to be able to read somebody else's scripts because there is some amazingly innovative stuff out there that looks like crap. If you can't read it, you don't know what it does, you throw it away, and all of a sudden, nothing works, right? So you have to be able to read other people's scripts, and you have to be able to, I'm gonna say it, I'm gonna say the D word, you have to document stuff. <laughs> Ooh, that's real popular in my organization. <laughs> One of those that's funny once moments was I was I filed a bug because I said I said that simply providing a link to to the docs in the application wasn't enough. You actually had to document the seri the various things because what they were doing is just forget the documentation, just link off to the docs site. Don't even need link to the thing that's important about the thing that you're talking about. Just link to the top of the doc site. It's got a search. <laughs> no. Um, so we used to say that the minimum level of documentation was uh, grepping all of the comments out of the source code and, and putting it into a single file. A README, right? No. Not good enough. Um, I really like it when a developer will actually <coughs> take the time to put some documentation in there. So one of my favorite things for, for years was uh, in the regular expressions section of classes, we'd always use grep. Because grep is a, you know, grep and egrep, right? So you can teach basic regular expressions and extended regular expressions. And then, so we would always use the kernel source code. And we would start off easy by searching for darn and heck and shoot and stuff like that. And then somebody would find, you know, and I would just say search for chainsaw. And then it would go south really quickly from there. There was a guy who years ago did this wonderful study about all the kernel source code and how difficult, what was the most difficult part of the kernel source code to write? And his theory was is that he would search for, he had a ranked severity of curse words. <laughs> I'm like, I like this guy already. Um, ranked severity of curse words. And then the number of instances of each one of these all conglomerated, this great set of charts and everything else, called a Linux kernel F word count. Um, and, the, and so basically it came back and said, it's the PCM CIA modules. They were the worst ones and the hardest ones. And everybody went, yep. <laughs> yep, those sucked. That was terrible. Uh, so I was like, oh, like, I hope this guy got a good grade on this paper. It was a paper for school. And, it, and he had it out on the web for the longest time. I was like, this is awesome. I like this. So when you, when you look at somebody's script, 
if they wrote it in the moment, they're probably not going to have documented it. As a matter of fact, I can't remember the last time I really saw a script documented unless it was in a distribution, right? So, and I, I'm afraid I don't, put, I don't put stuff in my scripts either. So, but you know that you might spend a half an hour developing a good script, you might spend a couple days, but if you amortize that thing for the next, you know, two years, you're going to save a lot of time. Okay, this is a fun one, I, and, I, and I, see a, I see a few, how should we put this, seasoned veterans in the room. I count myself as one of those. Um, no, I didn't just call anybody old. Relax. Um, how many of you have script files that are older than any of your children? Okay, right. Now, how can you have a script file that's older than one of your children? Do you use it still? I have one that I use every day. It's like 30 years old. And it's, it basically goes in and, say, and I, I say I'm in a directory and I want to know what all the, the single first level subdirectories of this are. I, it basically runs a du minus sh on each one of those and then sorts it properly in, in numeric sort so I can see, you know, gigabytes and, you know, and all the uh, descending order, right? I use the thing almost every day. How can I have something that's 30 years old that, that still works like that? Because it's Unix and Linux. It's not Windows, right? It's not every five years everything gets moved around, okay? Seven years, depends on. Okay, so. Hey, I made it this far without, without slashing Microsoft, okay? Uh, it was just a reflex. So I recommend going, <laughs> it was. I, I recommend going off and taking a look at this one. It's actually a really good tutorial about scripting. Scripting to me includes things, not just I want to run these five programs with some parameters. If you can elicit user input at the command line and store that as variables, if you can do for loops, if you can do any kind of looping at all, if you can come up with a case statement, right? You know what a case statement is? Where you basically type in parameters. Like if you go service start something or other, the start is a case statement. That's part of a case statement, okay? So then you're, that's, really, that's a really you know, involved script, all right? So I think scripting is very important and the reason why I think it's even more important is because I don't do programming, so if I don't do code, then I think scripting is really important. This is how I feel important. Okay. Applications. Um, application services is really interesting because this used to be almost solely the realm of a certain type of system operator, not even a person who was somebody who ran the servers, but somebody who ran the application services on the servers, right? Like, okay, interesting. So we're talking about databases, we're talking about WordPress. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that you need to know with this, and you need to understand how, you know, Redis is, this, when I first joined my organization and started encountering the various pieces and parts, I'd never heard of a Redis, I knew what the hell it was. Nobody could tell me. I read, I read the Wikipedia definition of what a Redis was and still didn't know what the hell it was. Well, so finally I came up, I, was, I looked at it, looked at it, set one up, started working with it, and I'm like, oh, oh, I can just basically go over and say, hey, add these five million lines of code or whatever it is together and give me the results of it. It's an in-memory calculation uh, tool mixed with a database. Anybody argue with that? Yeah, okay, right. So why couldn't they just say that? Go read the Wikipedia definition of it and see if you can see how closely that matches. Not at all. That's what I got out of my guys. Now, deployments. I only got a couple of minutes. I want to make sure we get to everything, but that's why I put everything in the slides as well. So when we talk about deployments, you need to understand what your platform is and understand the steps for deployment. So what I did was I actually used these two tutorials down here when I started getting used to AWS. When I first, first encountered what I was going to be doing, I'm like, well, I need to know how to do the deployments of these. This second one here, I think it is, this one, is a set of 10-minute tutorials that you can go through that are awesome. It's bite-sized pieces. You just go pick the one that you're interested in or you want to know. They're all laid out in a logical order and you can just you know work your way through those and by the time you get done with them you will know a lot more about what's going on. It's a really really good resource and then of course this here these are the big user guides right like mini multi-step stuff for that and you know deploying an app to the cloud you can start simple and get the concepts and then you can get really off in the weeds very quickly especially when you start having multi, you know, different servers doing different things at the same time and dependencies upon each other, et cetera. Load balancing threw me for a little while too, but I finally got it. Ah, uh, get in GitHub. Okay, so when I joined my organization, I could swear that 
everybody there was spawned from GitHub. They all natively, they, they had never known anything else. I said the word subversion and they thought I was talking about spy activities. <laughs> right? I, dude, okay. You know, I'm like, wait, what do you guys use? So I started looking at GitHub and it was hard for me because even though I understood the concept of version control, there was something there that didn't make sense to me. It took me a little while to figure it out. It was actually this guy here, the GitHub, Git and GitHub for Poets guy, that finally did something that was really kind. He separated coding from Git and GitHub. So everybody else was trying to teach you how to be a coder and Git and GitHub. And they were using these examples where you kind of lost the difference between what was what and why, why the hell did you do that kind of thing. So they were mixing programming and Git and GitHub. Now, most of you look at me and go, well, that's kind of interspersed. But uh, be patient here. This guy uses poems, songs, unicorns, rainbows, and he's kind of wacky and crazy. My kind of guy, all right? Just totally unafraid to do whatever it takes in order to get you to the point where you understand this thing. And somehow, strangely, it works. Because he separated the code from Git and GitHub, you don't ever think about the code at all. You're just looking at words on the page, and everything that he does merges the new word to the poem or the song or whatever it is, and you're just like, oh my God, this is so easy. Why didn't somebody do this before? So I recommend it. If you've got somebody in your organization and they're just, you know, they've gone off and they've read some of the GitHub stuff and they're just, they, you know, you, they, and they're like, I don't get it. Send them off to here to deal with him. It's about 10 or 12 videos and it's a lot of fun. You know, he, he does a really good job. Guy knows his stuff, really seriously knows it, but is able to explain it in such a way that it's completely unthreatening, right? As my wife says, she goes, she goes oh, he's kind of like the Pete Way of GitHub. I'm like, okay, I'm like, only I would get that one. That's like the, the uh, bassist for uh, UFO many years ago. Go look it up on YouTube. Anyway, guy was crazy, right? Just an absolute nutball all over the stage, right? I guess the theory was is that because he wasn't playing either as many strings, he would play four times as much notes and cover that much more territory, right? And I, one of my friends is a bassist, and he goes, I don't like that analogy. <laughs> right. It's a drummer's analogy. <laughs> what can I do? Uh, anyway, it was a lot of fun. I learned a lot. And suddenly, after watching this, I was able to dive into the rest of it. Totally got it. I'm like, thank you very much. Wrote him a note. He replies back instantly. It was awesome. Right. So send him off to there. YAML. Everything's configuration files. Absolutely everything is configuration files. I like to tell people these days that if it isn't in the YAML file, it isn't going to happen. Right? I, you should never be building something and deploying something unless it is generated from a, a static file that's either pulled from a repo or whatever. Why? Because you want to get it right and have it work, and then that becomes version one, and then off you go to the rest of it. Okay? So think of it as a recipe for baking. When you bake, so I, I cook a lot. Okay? Yes, I, I actually took a, uh, the basic CIA course uh, to be a chef. And I didn't get into baking because I like the way that cooking is done as opposed to baking. Okay? Baking is like sealing it in the rocket and sending it off and hoping that it gets there. Okay? Cooking is like riding the rocket and steering it as you go. Okay? I like that. It's this fire it off and maybe it'll work, maybe it won't. Well, if it all it is is a bunch of stuff, bless you. Uh, sorry, uh, may the deed of your choice accord you with favor. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, that was stored up for a while there. <laughs> One of the guys goes, or big blob of nothing. I'm like, okay, I'll add it, I'll add it. Uh, think about it. If you, if you are working with stuff that really doesn't really exist, it's other Unix boxes out there, and it doesn't really cost anything because all you're doing is spinning it up and you're testing it, you can fire it off, kill it, fire it off, kill it, adjust, get it just right. There's, there's no downside to that. If you were reinstalling the operating system and all the application services and everything else on a physical box every time, no way in the world you're going to do that. It's just not, it just doesn't even make sense, right? Okay, so, editors. My boss and I had a big argument because I wanted to get a copy of Sublime. I'm like, I'll buy it for myself if I have to. He goes, I want to see a comparison chart of yeah. why you're not going to use Atom or VS Code. So I went and found one. <laughs> <laughs> 
and wrote it all down in, my, in an email and sent it to him. And he goes, okay, that's pretty good. I approve it. I'm like, oh, that's good. He goes, all right, where'd you find the article? I'm like, oh, shit. <laughs> He's on to me. Um, these are great. These are great tools. I just happened to get started with Sublime and liked it. Okay, I am an old VI VIM guy. I I like I do a lot of graphical stuff these days, and it's just a lot easier for me to use something like Sublime with the GitHub Desktop if I have to, if that's the way the, the workflow happens. But I do spend a lot of time in VI and VIM. At, it's just the way I do it. I don't, I don't I feel weird calling it Vim. Uh, it's just VI to me. Uh, we have Emacs guys in the house, and there's another war between them, whatever, right? It's always a lot of fun. Um, this is a great, this is actually the best code editor. That's the article. Yes? I was just going to mention that there's a Vim mode in Sublime. Yes. <laughs> yeah, there's actually one in all of them, okay. by the way. Yeah, but uh, what's really fun is, is to send somebody a configuration hack that switches them to Vim mode. <laughs> you just send them a file and say, hey, take a look at this, and they open it up and it changes it. <laughs> Yeah, only do that to people you really don't like. <laughs> okay, really quickly here, config management. I just wanted to mention the various configuration management tools. Ansible, CF Engine, Chef, Puppet, Salt. I have a little experience with Salt because I worked on the SUSE Manager team for a while, uh, which is basically based on Salt and Salt Stack. Okay. So the whole concept of this is your like Ansible playbooks, uh, you know, the Chef uh, cookbooks. Basically, what you're doing is you're saying. This is how I want this to deploy. I'm going to fill out the whole thing. I'm going to test it until I get it right. And then this is going to be our test and our production. Both people, the test and production people, both run the exact same thing. Okay? I know that's hugely oversimplified, um, but that's what I got. Cloud providers, we already kind of talked about this. The big three, Amazon, I think is probably the current leader for right now. Uh, Google Cloud and Azure. Now, I'm a contrarian. That's why I threw this in there. So everybody in my organization just absolutely loves and believes in Amazon Web Services. So, of course, i got to go slightly different, right? I'm like, wow, and, I, and I'm, okay, so I can't quite do the Microsoft thing. So I had to kind of go off into Google Cloud, okay? But then my boss tells me, oh, I'm really getting to Google Cloud for my stuff. And I'm like, oh, crap, now i got to go to Azure. <laughs> <laughs> we need a fourth one, okay? Because <laughs> I'm getting boxed in and I don't like it, okay? But the key thing is, is go with one of them. Learn one, the rest of them are a lot easier to learn after that. It's all the same general concepts. Nobody's doing anything completely different than the others, okay? So you don't have to worry about that. Monitoring. I work for a company that does a monitoring tool. You figure out which one I think you ought to use, okay? <laughs> key thing is, if you want to, run off and take a look at our learning center. We just deployed the online labs scenario, I was heavily involved in that. Now you can do everything just completely based in the browser. All the lab scenarios are accessed through the browser. It's got a great editor and everything else. And so what you do is you open up a browser window to the Datadog tool, and then you go into the lab and you start doing the configurations over here and everything shows up over here. Now I like tools like this. I actually joined the company because I was around um, my boss, my boss's boss, Elon, uh, is one of the scale uh, uh, big cheeses and runs around and does all this stuff. And that, uh, when I applied to Datadog, he immediately saw that I had applied to Datadog and said, you need to come work on the training team because I was going to go be an SE. And so I really like the tool. I like any tool that lets me sit in one spot, see a single pane of glass, and lets me dive through and figure out what's going on. And it's really cool because we've got it down now to where you can go in, configure a monitor that does anything you want it to do, and then I can grab the URL.